Welcome. The topic of today's lecture is the spiral structure of galaxies. As we saw in the previous lecture, roughly 60% of the galaxies in the present day universe have spiral structures. What causes these structures to arise? And what maintains these structures? We shall try to understand this to some extent in this lecture. Let us look at some of the spirals in the universe. The first thing to understand is that the spiral structure does not vary with time. And how do we know this? This is because there appears to be a correlation between the spiral type and the total mass of the galaxy as well as the relative gas content of the galaxy. Neither the mass of the galaxy nor the gas content of the galaxy changes very rapidly. Therefore, we do not expect spiral structures to change very rapidly because of this correlation. If the spiral arms consisted of the same stars, let us say number 1, 2, 3, up to 10 to the power 9, then the spiral will wind up like the spring of a clock over a period of time due to the differential rotation of the galaxy. This was first pointed out by the Swedish astronomer Bertil Lindblad. Now look at the pictures that are shown over there. Let us assume that there are beads on these spokes. And here these beads are of course the galaxies. And as the galaxy rotates, we saw in the previous lecture, the galaxy rotates differentially, and with the angular velocity is different at different radii. Over a period of time, these spirals will wind up. Once every turn of the galaxy, it will wind up once. This is known as the winding dilemma. Why is this a dilemma? because we do not see galaxies with more than three or four arms. And yet, over its lifetime, the galaxy would have rotated many, many times. Therefore, we would expect the spiral to have wound up like the spring of old-fashioned clocks. But that is not the case. Therefore, Bertil Lindblad concluded that whatever is tracing the spirals in the slides that we saw before, cannot be the same stars or the same gas clouds. He concluded that the spiral lines must represent some sort of a density wave. This was pointed out by Bertil Lindblad. Now what is a density wave? Consider sound waves in a gas or in a solid. Sound waves are propagation of compression and rarefaction of the medium. So the density, the local density, varies with time. So the, and this local fluctuation in the density propagates, and that is the density wave. Now, please appreciate that if there is a river flowing, and I drop a big stone in the river, and when there are ripples created in the river, it is the ripples do not consist of the same molecules of water. All right? So it's a density wave that propagates. Let us now try to understand this a little better. So the first conclusion that Bertil Lindblad arrived at is that the spiral arms must represent some sort of a density wave. A density wave can move relative to the stars and gas. A density wave does not have to rotate differentially. 
it can rotate rigidly. But a density wave can also be damped out over time, just as sound waves in a gas or a liquid or a solid can be damped out after a certain time. Now look at this long exposure image of the Andromeda galaxy. What you see here is a more or less continuous distribution of stars. It looks like an omelette or a dosa. The spiral structure is not very pronounced. When you expose a galaxy for long periods of time, then you also pick up the light from the low mass stars, which are not very luminous. In a short exposure photograph, you pick up only the bright stars. But in a long exposure photograph, you pick up all the stars, including the low mass stars. The thing I want you to appreciate about this photograph of Andromeda galaxy is that there is no pronounced spiral structure. This implies that the low mass stars, which you see in this long exposure picture, are not necessarily associated with the spiral arms. On the other hand, if you look at very distant galaxies, then we'd see mainly the bright, luminous, massive stars. Remember, the luminosity of a star is proportional roughly to the cube of the mass. Therefore, you see only the more massive and luminous stars. Quite clearly, the massive stars are associated with spiral arms. In fact, they define the spiral structures. But Lindbergh's point was that the spiral arm, the stars in the spiral arms are not the same stars. They keep changing. Here is the neutral hydrogen in a map of our galaxy taken in the 21 centimeter emission of the neutral hydrogen atom. Quite clearly, you see that the neutral hydrogen gas clouds are associated with spiral arms, just as the massive stars were. Look at this infrared image on the top of the Andromeda galaxy. Over here on the left where the cursor is, is the long exposure image of Andromeda galaxy where you also pick up the low mass stars and the spiral structure is not very pronounced. But if you look in this picture over there, which is taken in the infrared, 24 microns, and uh, in this picture, it is a, taken at 24 microns, 70 microns, and 160 microns. You clearly see the spiral structure. What this tells us is that the molecular clouds, the giant molecular clouds, which are the dust clouds, are also associated with spiral arms, just as the massive blue stars are associated with spiral arms. Here is the carbon monoxide emission from an external galaxy. What you see is the emission which arises when the carbon monoxide molecule jumps from J equal to one rotational level to J equal to zero rotational level emitting radiation at 115 gigahertz or three millimeters in wavelength. Quite clearly, this picture demonstrates that molecular clouds, the giant molecular clouds, are also associated with spiral arms. So let me summarize. Low mass stars are not necessarily associated with spiral arms, but the massive stars, the uh, Molecular clouds and the dust clouds are indeed associated with spiral arms. So let us summarize what we have said so far. Spiral arms cannot be made a fixed collection of stars, because if they did, then they will wind up every time the galaxy rotates once. The low mass stars are not primarily associated with spiral arms. Massive stars are closely associated with spiral arms. Gaseous nebulae, which are illuminated by ultraviolet radiation from massive stars, are found in spiral arms. Atomic clouds, seen in 21 centimeter emission, 
molecular cloud seen in the infrared and in millimeter wave radiation are found in spiral arms. So here is yet another picture to convince you of this. What you see on the left is a visible a photograph in the visible. You see these dark dust lanes. These are presumed to be dust clouds or dust associated with giant molecular clouds. What you see on the right is the infrared image where you see the infrared, infrared radiation from dust clouds. And quite clearly, you see that what is seen here as dark lanes is seen here as bright emission in the infrared. Here is another example. Here is an example of stars and nebulae energized by the ultraviolet radiation from blue massive stars are also associated with spirals. Now let's try to understand the spiral density wave. Let's first consider a kinematic model. In a kinematic model, which was first advanced by Bertil Lindblad, gravity is not taken into account. This is just a model. We don't know why this model should be right, but let's just consider this model first. To repeat again, the role of gravity is neglected in this model. Now, listen to this very carefully. Let us look at the galaxy from an inertial frame. In the inertial frame, the galaxy is rotating. What that means is that the stars in the galaxy are going around the center of the galaxy as in need of the gas clouds and the dust clouds. Now, viewed from an inertial frame, the mean motion of stars in an unperturbed galaxy or circular, circular orbits with a little excursion about the plane of the orbit. At an angular velocity omega, and this angular velocity, of course, depends on the radius at which the star is going around the center of the galaxy. Omega is a function of the galactocentric radius r. Let the angular velocity of the pattern be omega p. The pattern is our spiral structure, and the spiral structure is rotating with an angular velocity omega p. It is rotating rigidly, namely, the spiral pattern's angular velocity is the same at all galactocentric radii. This is as viewed from an inertial system. Now, let us jump from the inertial system to a rotating frame of reference, which is rotating at the same angular velocity as the pattern is rotating, namely omega subscript p. In this frame, in this rotating frame, the circular orbits of the stars will not be at an angular velocity of omega, but omega minus omega p because we are not looking at it from an inertial frame, but we are looking at it from a rotating frame, which itself is rotating with an angular velocity omega p. Now, in this rotating frame, let us distort the orbits of the star from perfect circles to oval shape. So each circle has been distorted to an oval shape. An oval is approximately an ellipse. Now, I have distorted these circles into oval shape in a particular fashion in which the major axes of all these ovals are aligned. I didn't have to do this, but I have chosen to do this. Now, we have thus created a stationary elliptical distortion of the galaxy. Please remember, we are now in the rotating frame. So in the rotating frame, the orbits of the stars are no longer circles, but they are ovals, but the ovals are aligned for no special reason. They just happen to be aligned. Now, now let us jump from the rotating frame to the inertial frame. In the inertial frame, all these oval orbits will persist 
they will process at the rate of omega p, and all of them will process at the same rate. Why will they process? Remember, originally in the inertial frame, the stars are going in circular orbits. Now we have distorted the circles to ovals, therefore the ovals will also be rotating. In other words, the major axis of the oval will change its orientation. Another way of saying that is the oval will process. So all the ovals will process at the same angular velocity omega p. Why? Because I have created such an artificial distortion. Now, I'm going to do something interesting. I am going to rotate the oval orbits by an angle capital theta. I am going to make that angle capital theta depend on the radius of the orbit. That is shown over here. And so let's look at it. So let's consider this particular circular orbit which has been distorted to be an oval orbit. Now let's consider the next oval orbit what I'm going to do is I'm going to change, rotate the semi-major axis of that oval by an angle theta of r. Then I go to the next oval, the larger oval. And I'm going to rotate it by a different r. In other words, what I'm now doing is to distort the galaxy. I'm now viewing it in the rotating frame. I'm going to distort the galaxy. Now this distortion is not an artificial distortion where all the ovals were aligned. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the ovals rotated with respect to one another by a phase angle capital theta, which itself depends upon the galactocentric radius. Now, so rotate the oval orbits by an angle capital theta, and this theta depends upon capital R, where capital R is the mean radius of the orbit, or the dist mean distance of the star from the center of the galaxy. So what we will now have is a distortion of this type. So this distortion has become this distortion simply because they have introduced a phase which is different for different orbits. Now let us populate these ovals with stars. Let us stick stars on each of these ovals, large number of stars on each of these ovals. Therefore, the density of the stars is roughly proportional to the distance between the two neighboring orbits. So, so now I have stars, these lines are really consisting of stars closely stuck to the, on each oval. And so what I'm saying is the density of stars, I'm having problems with the cursor again, the density of stars will be more here, the density of stars will be less here, and the density of stars will be more here. So the density of stars is roughly proportional to the distance between two neighboring orbits. So what we have created is a bisymmetric spiral arm structure with two arms. It's a bisymmetric spiral structure with two spiral arms. There is no bar in this particular uh, kinematic model. So I hope you understood what I said. You go to the rotating frame, a frame which is rotating at the same angular velocity as the pattern is rotating, and you distort the circular orbits to oval orbits, distort them in a rotated manner so that the major, semi-major axis of the oval is rotated because I've introduced a phase capital theta, which is the function of the galactocentric radius. Now, the spiral arms that I have created are stationary in the rotating frame. Now, if I jump from the rotating frame to the inertial frame, I will find that the spirals will now be rotating with an angular pattern with a speed omega p. So, with respect to the inertial frame, the density wave which I have created, the density wave in the distribution of stars which I have created, 
will rotate rigidly with an angular velocity omega p. Now why do I call it a wave? It is a wave because it's very clear from the fact that each in the inertial state, uh, frame, each star is rotating about the galactic center with an angular velocity omega, which is a function of r. And this angular velocity is much larger than the angular velocity of the spiral pattern, which is omega p. And omega p does not depend upon capital R. It is rigidly rotating. It is not differentially rotating. So we see two bisymmetric spiral arms. The spiral arms are stationary in the rotating frame. With respect to the inertial frame, the density wave rotates rigidly with an angular velocity omega p. Now this idea was first introduced by Bertil Lindblad in 1963. This idea was developed further by C.C. Lin and his students and collaborators over many years, starting roughly around 1964. And Frank Shu was one of the uh, associates of C.C. Lin when this important work was done. Now, what C.C. Lin and his collaborators did was to regard the stellar disk that we discussed consisting of stars and gas clouds, atomic clouds, and molecular clouds, a sort of a fluid. Now, the essence of the density wave theory, dynamical density wave theory developed by C.C. Lin and his collaborators, is to find a gravitational perturbation such that the spiral wave is the normal mode of the galaxy. In why a normal mode? Because normal modes are long-lasting. If I pluck a string at some random point, a string which is tied at two ends, then it will vibrate in all sorts of modes, but the modes that will survive are the modes which are normal modes, which correspond to standing waves, and so on. Now, such a normal mode will be self-sustaining and therefore long-lasting. We want the spiral structures to last for a long time. The present thinking is that the inclusion of the gas clouds in the disk helps in stabilizing the spiral wave. Now, this is a very complicated theory, and surely this is not the forum to go into the complexities of the spiral density wave theory. But let's try to understand the essence of it. According to this theory, the spiral arms that we see in galaxies represent at any given moment the local maxima of the density wave. Just as a wave propagating in a river represents the maxima of the amplitude of vibration. In a similar fashion, the spiral arms represent at any given moment the local maxima of the density wave. Now, this density wave includes stars as well as gas clouds, atomic clouds as well as molecular clouds. But there is an important difference between this density wave and, say, sound wave. Now, sound wave is caused by pressure variations. But this density wave is not caused by any pressure variation. It is caused and maintained by perturbations in the gravitational field. Perturbations which arise spontaneously, and because these perturbations are normal modes, they are self-sustaining. Now, in a sense, the density wave is similar to waves in a plasma. You know what a plasma is. It consists of positive and negative charges bound together by a frozen in magnetic field. The electrons in a metal like sodium or copper is a plasma because you have the nuclei consists of ions. The electrons have been liberated. The valence electrons have been liberated they go into the conduction band, and therefore you have free electrons. So in a metal, you really have a plasma. 
what you have in metals and other plasma are oscillations, oscillations of the positive and negative charge with respect to one another. These oscillations have all sorts of wavelengths, but infinite wavelength or lambda is equal to infinity or as frequency tends to zero, the frequency of this oscillation is given by square root of 4 pi n e squared divided by n, where n is the number of charged particles per unit volume and m is the mass of the particle. This is known as plasma oscillations. These plasma oscillations arise spontaneously. They are driven and maintained by the electromagnetic field. In a similar fashion, C. C. Lin and his collaborators took the approach that a tightly wound spiral arm in a galaxy is caused by gravitational perturbation. What kind of a perturbation? They said it is created by a spontaneously arising gravitational perturbation of the type that is shown over there. Any perturbation has a radial part and an angular part, and also there is a time dependence. So now let's look at the right hand side. The time dependence is given by e to the power i omega t. The spatial or radial dependence is given by v, which is a function of r only. Then there is a phase factor, e to the power i times some phase. And that phase consists of two terms. The first term is a constant phase. It, it is m times theta, where m can be 2 or 4 or some number like that. It is constant at all radius. And then I have introduced a phase capital phi, which is a function of the radius itself. That is the second term in the exponential. So let me define these things properly. So in the expansion over here, which is the perturbation in the gravitational field, r and theta are the polar coordinates. V of r is the amplitude of the wave perturbation, that is the amplitude. M is the number of spirals, so m is equal to two means there are two spiral arms. And capital phi of r is the radial phase at a distance, capital R, from the center of the galaxy. So this phase changes as we go from the center of the galaxy towards the outer boundary of the galaxy. Now let us go from the inertial frame to a frame rotating at the same rate as the density wave pattern. So we go to a frame, we jump on the spiral wave, and we go to a frame which is rotating at the same angular velocity as the spiral wave. In that frame, the time-dependent factor e to the i omega t simply disappears because I've gone to a rotating frame. In that frame, the potential uh, the perturbation is time independent because I'm in a rotating frame. Now, at any given time t, and on any particular circle with a mean radius capital R, the gravitational perturbation potential can be represented by this potential over there at the top, if you get rid of the time factor, is now a function of only r and theta. So there is an amplitude V of R and cosine of M theta plus phi of R. So this is the phase. Theta is a phase which is constant over all galactocentric radius. And capital phi of R is the phase that depends upon the uh, radius. Now let us look at this very carefully. So the potential, the perturbation potential is what is shown there. And let us look at the circular orbit and see what this perturbation does to that circular orbit. And let us consider the case where m is equal to 2. So if I put m is equal to 2 in this equation, please take a paper and pen or pencil, whatever you use, and convince yourself 
But this circle will now become an oval because m is equal to 2. Now, let's look at this once again. So there is the potential in the rotating frame, a frame which is rotating along with the spiral pattern. And in that frame, and we are considering m is equal to 2, the circular orbit has become a normal orbit. Now, let us do this at various radius r. Well, r is the distance from the center of the galaxy. Now, and in doing so, let us introduce a phase capital Phi, which depends upon capital R. We are doing exactly the same thing we did in the kinematic model of Bertil Lindblad. But this is the dynamical model where we are saying this perturbation, gravitational perturbation, is of that nature. So we are going to introduce a phase phi of r and do this at various radius. So at a different radius, it is an oval, the magenta oval, and the magenta oval is rotated with respect to the yellow oval, which is a distorted version of this Sion blue um, circular orbit. So now I've done this in four different ways, and they are shown over there. Now what is shown on the left of these four panels is that this phase factor phi of r is random. It does vary as a function of capital R, but there is no systematic way in which it is varying. It is random. So the result of that will be a complete distortion of the lattice, but there is no wave. Now let us look at this case. Here, the phase factor phi is the, is, is the same for all ovals, and then I get a pattern like this, and this is a bar. This is a bar, it's not a spiral wave. Now, let us introduce a phase factor phi over there, which is rapidly increasing with increasing r. So here is an example of that, and here is another example of that. This does not have a bar. This has a bar. So this is a spiral wave, spiral galaxy without a bar. This is a spiral galaxy with a bar. Okay, and how have these spiral patterns and the bars arisen? Due to a spontaneously arising gravitational perturbation, which in the rotating frame is of this form. Why should such a perturbation arise? Is a different question altogether. What we are saying is, if such a perturbation arises, then it will result in the density wave, just as we saw in the kinematic model. Now, this density wave rotates at a rate slower than rotates rigidly. First thing, it does not rotate differentially, and the rotation rate is much slower than the motion of the stars and gas clouds in the galaxy. So it's like a river in which the water is flowing rather fast. And then there is a wave created by a boat or a falling stone in the river, and that wave is propagating much more slowly than the streaming velocity of the river. Now, therefore, try to listen to this very carefully. Therefore, stars, gas clouds, atomic clouds, molecular clouds, etc., will move through the density wave as they rotate around the center of the galaxy. Just as there are ripples in a, in, a, in a river, and as the water in the river flows, then what you see is that if, if you could color the water, then the water will flow through these ripples. The ripples themselves are moving, they are moving slowly, but the water is moving even faster than that. Now, when these gas clouds and stars pass through the density wave, they will slow down temporarily. 
and after they have passed the maxima of the density wave, they will speed up once again. This is exactly what happens to your car as it enters a traffic jam. A car is coming very fast. As it approaches a traffic jam in the highway, it slows down. Then it passes the traffic jam and then speeds up again. So our spiral density wave is just like a traffic jam. But a special type of a traffic jam, the traffic jam itself is moving rather slowly. Why will a traffic jam move? Suppose there is an accident in the road, then the traffic jam will be only at that location. Because of the accident, one lane of the highway is closed, so all the four lanes have to now go in two or three lanes, so there is a jam. Then after the cars go through the traffic jam, they'll speed up again. But the traffic jam will remain in the same spot till the broken down truck or bus is taken by a crane. But we are considering a different kind of a traffic jam. Imagine that you are in a four-lane divided highway. Two lanes going in this direction, two lanes going in the, that, that direction, and in the middle there is a mean, nasty, concrete divider. Now, there is a heavy truck which is going in the fast lane, in the right lane. It is not supposed to be in the right lane, but we know that in India all uh, rules are there to be broken, therefore the heavy truck, slow moving truck will be in the right lane. And this causes a jam, because there are two lanes, and because one lane is occupied by the truck, the other lane cars also have to come to the free lane, so there is a traffic jam. And once the cars overtake the slowly moving truck, they'll speed up again. But the truck is moving. The truck is not a broken down truck. It is moving rather slowly. So you have a traffic jam which itself is moving, and cars slow down when they are going through the jam and speed up again. The same thing happens to stars and gas clouds as they go through the spiral density wave. Let me say it once again. The stars and the gas clouds are rotating about the center of the galaxy according to the rotation curve. Their angular velocity is determined by its radius of the distance from the galactic center. But the spiral pattern is rotating rigidly. Therefore, the stars and the gas clouds will go through the spiral arms, emerge, go through the other spiral arm, and the story will go on. Now, Remember, yes, this I have already explained. So let us look at this now. You see here, the stars are going through. This is the spiral density wave, which itself is rotating, but the stars are moving through it. Now, a spiral density wave will drive a shock into the interstellar medium. The passage of a shock will not have much effect on the stellar component of the, spy, of the, of the galaxy, but it will have a profound effect on the gas clouds in the galaxy. In the region corresponding to the maxima of the density wave, Stars and gas clouds spend more time, like cars spend more time in the region where there is traffic jam. And cars can collide because they are uh, jostling for space, and therefore it is more likely that there will be small accidents in the traffic jam. There will be collisions between the cars. In a similar fashion, there will be random motions of atomic hydrogen clouds and and these collisions may result in the merger of atomic hydrogen cloud leading to the formation of denser clouds which then become the giant molecular clouds. So one of the theories about the formation of giant molecular clouds is that they are formed at the location of the spiral density maximum. 
where atomic clouds collide, merge, and become from atomic clouds to molecular clouds. Now, a spiral wave will drive a shock through the giant molecular clouds. This will cause a compression of the giant molecular cloud, triggering the collapse of the molecular cloud and the formation of a cluster of stars. Therefore, you will expect to find all along the spiral density wave maximum giant molecular cloud as well as newly formed stars, star clusters, because the clouds themselves have been formed partly due to the passage of the atomic clouds through this traffic jam. And then there's been a compression of the molecular clouds, which has resulted in their collapse and the formation of stars. This is how big associations of massive stars form along the spiral. So let's look at this picture. I showed you so many beautiful uh, slides of galaxies. Let us look at this picture. Here is a galaxy which is rotating in a clockwise direction. That means all the stars and the gas clouds are rotating in a clockwise direction with an angular velocity which depends on the radius. And there is the location of a density wave maximum. And here, the atomic clouds are converted to molecular clouds. And having been converted, the molecular cloud will move on with an angular velocity, which is larger than the angular velocity of the spiral pattern. And therefore, uh, the newly formed stars from the uh, collapse of the molecular cloud will then move on. So the molecular cloud transforms itself into giant ionized gas regions and then after gas disperses you begin to see the stars. So this is what you would expect according to this simplified density wave theory of spiral arms. You would expect to find in, ahead of the spiral arm stars, little, trailing a little bit behind or associations of gas clouds with stars which are illuminated by the ultraviolet radiation. And then behind the density wave, you expect to find molecular cloud. So this is what you expect to find. And what do we find? So once again, these are the giant molecular cloud. These are the gaseous nebulae illuminate excited and illuminated by the ultraviolet radiation from massive stars and these are the young blue star clusters what do we find so let's look have a close up at this galaxy in the visible light and you see this dust lanes and you see brilliant stars So these are the giant molecular clouds on one side of the density maximum and young clusters of massive stars on the other side of the density maximum, exactly as I had uh, led you to believe in the previous slide. So here is another picture. Now let us ask why is there a density wave? What is the basic reason for this gravitational perturbation to arise? I hope you have understood that once I give you such a gravitational perturbation, then it will result in a density wave, a spiral density wave, as I showed you. But why? what is the basic reason? Well, the basic reason is the following. Like in stars, a galaxy would like to gain binding energy. Remember, binding energy is negative. So, a nucleus or a star or a galaxy would like to be bound more tightly, gain binding energy. And this it accomplishes by the central region contracting. 
In the stars, the binding energy gained by the contraction of the central region of the star results in the expansion of the outer layers of the star. This is how stars become giant. In two lectures from now, when we discuss the life history of stars, we will discuss this in greater detail. Stars become giants towards the end of their lives. And the reason why they become giant, for example, the sun with a present radius of a million kilometers will expand to a radius of about 300 times larger. It will become a red super giant. It does so because the central region of the star contracts and the binding energy that is released expands the rest of the star. So one picture is worth 10,000 words, ancient Chinese saying, and let us look at this very carefully. So here I have a star, and here is the central region of the star. Mm -hmm. And let us say the central region of the star contracts. Why it contracts is a different matter. But let's consider that it contracts. As it contracts, the gravitational binding energy increases. Why? Because the gravitational binding energy is minus g m squared divided by r. Where m is the mass of that blue region and r is the radius of that blue region. And it is negative. Now, therefore, positive energy is released when the core, is, uh, core contracts. And this energy goes into the expansion of the envelope. And this is how stars become giants. This is known as gravothermal catastrophe. Now, this is actually seen to happen in globular clusters of stars, which consists of roughly a million stars bound together by mutual gravity. The central region of the globular cluster contracts, and the gravitational binding energy results in the expansion of the globular cluster. And this is how the stars in the outer regions of the globular clusters attain velocity greater than the escape velocity from the cluster and escape from the cluster itself. Now, in the case of the galaxy, if the central region of the galaxy contracts, the contracting matter has to worry about one other thing, namely the conservation of angular momentum. In the cartoon that I showed before, the star was not rotating. Therefore, it was a matter of simple contraction. But our galaxy is rotating. Therefore, if the galaxy contracts, it will spin up. It will have more angular momentum. That will violate the conservation of angular momentum. So it has to, if it has to contract, then it has to get rid of the excess angular momentum it would have gained by virtue of the contraction. Now, since the matter is contracted to have higher angular momentum than before, this will prevent the contraction due to centrifugal force. Therefore, the, if the contraction has to occur, then the angular momentum gained will have to be gotten rid of, and you do that by transporting it outwards. It has been argued by several uh, astronomers who have been doing these calculations that this transport of angular momentum outwards, which is necessary for the central region of the star to contract, is accomplished by the spiral density wave. So the basic reason, according to this way of thinking, the basic reason for the spiral density wave to arise is to be able to transport the angular momentum outwards as the central region of the galaxy contracts. So the spiral wave is a way to transport angular momentum outwards. Now let us look at a very spectacular demonstration and watch this very carefully. You notice the stars moving outwards. Of 
course, then they fall in. Otherwise, the galaxy will disappear. So you clearly see that Well, I think I think we lost that. So let's. Uh, so so in that simulation, uh, you clearly see that the spiral density wave helps in the transport of angular momentum outwards. Now let us summarize what we have said. The spiral arms represent, at any given moment the local maxima of the density wave. The density wave includes both stars as well as gas clouds. The density wave is not caused by pressure variations like sound wave. The density wave is caused and maintained by perturbations, by spontaneously arising perturbations in the gravitational field. In this sense, the density wave in a galaxy is similar to plasma waves or plasma oscillations, which are created and maintained in a plasma by the electromagnetic field. And the density wave in a galaxy is created and maintained by the gravitational field itself. There is another analogy between a gravitating system and a plasma. Plasma oscillations in a metal, for example, are damped over time. Now, we know that if I have a, a, a bucket of water or some liquid or oil, and I drop a billiard ball or a ball bearing, then it will slow down and reach a terminal velocity. This is due to viscosity of the liquid. The viscosity of the liquid arises due to collision between the molecules. So we understand damping phenomena or friction in terms of collisions and the energy which is uh, exchanged during these collisions. But what was discovered by the great Russian physicist Landau was that this damping of waves in a plasma will arise even if the charges in the plasma do not physically collide with one another. In other words, even in a collisionless plasma, there is damping or there is friction. In a similar fashion, if I have a star system like a globular cluster, then there is friction in that system, even though the stars in a globular cluster may not physically collide with one another. Therefore, a globular cluster, for example, or stars in a galaxy, or a collisionless gravitational system, like a collisionless plasma. One of the great discoveries that Chandrasekhar made, and this one he made when he was a very young man, was that, that such a dynamical friction arises in stellar systems, where a massive star is going through low mass stars. So the, the massive star experiences a drag or a friction which is dynamical in origin. This dynamical friction has turned out to be rather important uh, 70 years after it was discovered in many systems, including, for example, the globular uh, clusters, where you find neutron stars and black holes primarily near the center of the globular cluster. So the thinking is that the friction, due to friction, they have sunk towards the dynamical center of the globular cluster. Similarly, when two galaxies merge, the central black holes in the galaxy will eventually merge. This is how we believe the mass of galaxies grows till finally it attains a mass of million times or a billion times the mass of the sun. So this idea of a dynamical friction in a collisionless gravitating system is another example of a phenomenon which arises purely due to the gravitational field. Now with that, we conclude our discussion of the density wave theory of spiral structures. The next topic we shall take up is very different, namely the life history of stars. 
Now it turns out that the life history of stars depends upon its mass, whether it's a low mass star or a massive star. So we will discuss this in three consecutive lectures. A crucial piece of physics that governs the life history of stars is the equation of state of the gas. What is the equation of state? The dependence of pressure on the density and temperature. For example, in classical physics, the pressure of a gas is given by Boyle's law. Boyle's law says that the pressure is equal to density times the temperature multiplied by Boltzmann's constant, nKT. In, for a quantum gas, this equation of state will be very different, the de dependence of pressure on density and temperature. Now the point I'm making is that this equation of state plays a very fundamental role in the life history of stars. It is very different if the gas behaved classically or if the gas behaved quantum mechanically. Therefore, um, uh, in order to understand the life history of stars, we shall have to understand what is the essential difference between a classical gas and a quantum gas? When does a gas behave classically and when does it behave quantum mechanically? To give you a flavor for this, I am proposed to devote the next lecture to a brief summary of quantum statistics. In particular, I shall consider the statistics obeyed by particles such as electrons, protons and neutrons because these are the particles that we are concerned with in a star. And that statistics is the Fermi Dirac statistics. And we shall discuss the behavior of the quantum system of electrons, of protons, and neutrons at extremely low temperature, indeed, even at absolute zero of temperature. Thank you very much.